So what I'm going to do is give you a little introduction to the chapter because it's been a long time since we've seen this stuff. So when I say a reaction is spontaneous, right? what do I mean? Yeah, well, proceeds without any external influence, right? Proceeds on its own. And another way to say it is it just happens. Right? It just happens. You don't have to do anything. It just happens. So what do we mean by non-spontaneous? So this is a tricky word because non-spontaneous means what? It, yeah, it just means it doesn't proceed on its own as written. Okay, so let's check this. I'm going to write this. Let's say for spontaneous, I said A goes to B. All right? If I looked at that reaction, it was spontaneous, then B goes to A, could not be spontaneous. In fact, it would be non-spontaneous. Right? Because A goes to B is spontaneous, B goes to A has to be non-spontaneous. Because it, if it's spontaneous going from A to B, it won't happen on its own going from B to A. And reality is, is non-spontaneous reactions are are spontaneous in the reverse direction. They're not spontaneous. When we say something's not spontaneous, it's just not spontaneous the way we wrote it. Okay? Most of the time, we can write it as a spontaneous reaction somehow. So we're going to go over um, a lot of this, but just to review, what's the thermodynamic symbol associated with spontaneous and non-spontaneous? Do you remember? I think you, what did you say, Oscar? Delta, delta G. G. Yeah, remember Delta G? That's the one you learn about in Chem 1B from Dr. G. And you know, I'm going to not say uh, is equal to, but is less than zero. Okay. Free energy is negative. It's a spontaneous reaction. And then, so that means spon non-spontaneous delta G is positive. So it's greater than zero. If delta G is equal to zero, the system's at equilibrium. Okay? Your delta G zero is at zero, then it means at standard state it's at equilibrium. All right. Free energy, that's the name of that guy. Okay. What does the free energy represent? We know. It's the energy available to drive a reaction to equilibrium. Okay? It's the energy available to drive a reaction to equilibrium. That's kind of what it means. I don't know how they actually really define it. That's how I've always defined it. There's, so it's the energy available. to, let's say, take a reaction to equilibrium. I like to say drive because I'm a chemist, but, you know, drive or take a reaction to equilibrium.
Okay, so. You might remember from Chem 1B, free energy is also known as the available work energy. It's how much work you could get out of a system, right? And it continues to give you energy until it gets to equilibrium. And that's why I call it, it's the free energy available to go or drive a reaction to equilibrium. So the free energy is created by a couple of different things or can be described by a couple of different things. And the factors, we call them enthalpy and entropy. So I gave you some terms, right? Enthalpy, though, the symbolically, do you remember what that is? Delta H. And that's also known as the heat of the reaction. And then there's entropy, which is delta S. Now, <clears throat> the only word I know to call entropy is entropy. Okay. It's also, but I'm going to guess most of you don't know this one. It's availability of states. The more states something can be in, the higher its entropy. Okay? They like to call it disorder. Right? It's related to this idea of disorder. If you have a lot of available states and you put stuff in the available states, then you have disorder. Right? So we'll talk more about that. Any questions on that? Because entropy is one of those ones, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of taught differently depending on how crazy your teacher is. How many of you have heard the term availability of states? Okay. How many of you heard disorder? Okay. So it's not entirely disorder. So I may have to talk to you guys a little bit more about this. And then the other thing that's really important that we talk about okay, is systems and surroundings. What's the system usually in chem chemistry? Where is the reaction? It's the reaction itself. So most of the time, the system is our reaction. And surroundings, this is where chemists get really dramatic. I always thought they're a little bit overly dramatic about this. It's the universe. Yeah, I know. It's like... <laughs> so what's your domain? I'm a chemist. My domain's the universe. Actually, it's really the reaction. We don't have much control over the universe. So I'm just going to say everything else. Okay? Okay, so with that, we're going to talk a little bit about all these things. Not today. I'm going to go slow. I might end a little early. Yesterday was my birthday, and I worked all day. I worked... I, yeah, I went from, I went from, I left my house be, before 7, like 6 o'clock, and I didn't get home till like 10 o'clock, and I'm not talking four hours, I'm talking the other, you know, and that, that's what the whole week has been like, I just haven't been able to get home, and so. No, no, it's good. I, I, ha no, no. I have had, I'm here, and this is what I love to do, and so I really enjoy it, but. Yeah, I'm tired. I didn't even have time to eat my cake. Actually, one of my students gave me a little cake. It's really pretty, and it's got a little thing on it, but I wanted to share it with my wife. So I didn't really see her much yesterday. I was like, you know, kind of sad. So I wanted to sit out and split the cake with her and Andrew. And, you know, when you have a lot of kids... And I wanted to get ice cream, but I didn't have to get, to get ice cream. So I want to get all these things together, and then maybe tonight I'll see her, and we'll sit down, and we'll have cake and ice cream, and it'll be pretty awesome. Oh, I 
if you guys could get through lap quickly. Otherwise, I'm going to give you all Fs, and then we're going to be out of there. We'll be out of there anyways, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, then I woke up, then I woke up like at four in the morning. I don't know why, and then so I go on to Facebook, and I see like, wow, I've got like five billion notices, so I'm one of those people, I have to like every single one of those people that send me a little birthday thing. So I'm sitting in their bed like this, on my phone. All right, sorry. And that all got recorded. So... <laughs> So let's talk about energy, okay? Let's talk about energy. First of all, we got to talk, I, I rearranged these slides. I switched this slide with the next slide, okay? We're going to talk about enthalpy. That's the energy term. Bonds, we usually talk about bonds breaking, but we don't really describe that very well. And so one of the things you have to be aware of, that when we talk about bond energies in this class, we're talking about what's known as a homolytic bond cleavage. And in a homolytic bond cleavage, what happens is, you get one electron going back to each of the original atoms, okay? And you'll notice just one of the little side little details in this slide, that's a one-headed arrow. One-headed arrow means one electron moved. Two-headed arrows means two electrons moved. When you get a homolytic bond cleavage, you don't get the <coughs> formation of ions. It's just the breaking of the bond, okay? Bond dissociation energies, which are listed in table 6.1, uh, we'll talk about um, are all for homolytic bond cleavage. Heterolytic bond cleavage is what you're used to really from Chem 1A. Right? Heterolytic bond cleavage is the formation of ions. Both electrons go one way. There's a whole different table for these kinds of things, okay? Ionic bond tables. So just be clear on that. And what the energy does when you talk about a homolytic bond cleavage is actually provides the energy. Remember we talked about molecular orbital theory. The two atomic orbitals come together. They both have an electron. And what happens when the bond forms, the electrons drop into this lower energy level. Ooh, I should really use a one-headed arrow. And that's how the bond forms. <coughs> when the bond breaks, all it's really doing is pushing the electrons back into the atomic orbitals and splitting the, splitting the bond homolytically that way, okay? So breaking bonds always requires energy because making bonds always releases energy. So that's a big takeaway from that. Breaking bonds And then making bonds releases energy. <coughs> okay, so on table six point one in your book, or they call it figure. It looks something like this. What's the strongest bond on there? Oh, by the way, <laughs> as much as we tell you in general chemistry, like, oh yeah, everything has to be in, like, joules, right? Organic chemists still love the kcal, <laughs> the kilocalorie, right? So you can ignore this column, but when I mention energies, I might inter inadvertently switch back and forth just because I know a lot of them in calories just because I'm old like that. So what is the strongest bond that's up there? HF. Right, HF. And what's the next strongest? Right, HH. And you notice the hydrogen? Oh, it's H HBr. Oh, is there HBr too? Yes. Yeah. yeah that one. There, that one's pretty high. HCl, HF. Oh, at 498. Yeah, look at that. Okay. So, what do you notice that uh, hydrogen? What general property with hydrogen? Its bonds are pretty strong. Why do you think that is? It's small. It's small, right? 
bonds are shorter because it's small, and we know that as the radius of a bond or the, the diameter or radius decreases between the two atoms, what happens is the bond gets stronger. So that's why you see like HI is 297, and just look at the trend here, all right? Hydrogen to hydrogen, one of the stronger bonds just because it's two hydrogens. But in uh, oxygen and in fluorine, those are small, highly electronegative atoms, so they tend to pull, they've got a lot of nuclear charge to make that bond stronger. So a lot of little different factors that play into effect. So if I want to homolytically break a bond like H and H, because that's the easiest one to draw, if I want to do this, and you know I made the bond really long because it's really hard to fit the arrows in. If I want to do that, that's a homolytic bond cleavage. That's 435 kilojoules of energy are going to be required. So is that endothermic or exothermic? Endo, because it's absorbing. Energy has to be put in as bonds are broken, which means all bond formation, because remember, it always takes energy to break a bond, so bond formation is always going to be the opposite. So all bond formation is... Bond formation, exothermic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I just like these tables. I think they're cool. Well, I'm not going to do any calculations. I need to check to see really how important the calculations in this book will be for later. <laughs> but you guys remember that you can use these tables to calculate enthalpies of reactions based on bonds that are broken and formed, maybe? I don't know. Okay, maybe not. So, let's say, how is heat energy exchanged between the system, which is the reaction, and the solution? It doesn't actually have to be a solution. It could be gas phase. It just could be to the universe, okay? For each of the following scenarios, okay? So, H and F free radicals. Free radical means one electron, not two, right? Unpaired electron. Nice. Oh, you know, I could just point like this, but I'm still used to pointing it more. H and F free radicals come together to form bonds. What's the energy exchange going to be? Exothermic. The system, the reaction, is going to be liberating energy to the surrounding. So that would be, if you wanted to write it out, H radical plus F radical form HF. This is going to be exothermic. CBR bond is broken. C yeah, endothermic. Like so, this, like this. That C obviously has to be bonded to something else, but I'm just talking about the one bond. I'll put all the electrons back onto the BR. He looks better with all of his pairs. Now, <clears throat> let's say you break a strong bond and you form a weak bond. Which way is that going to be? This one's endo. Okay, you're going to break a strong bond, so you're going to have to put energy in, and when the weak bond is formed, you're going to get less energy out, so the overall process is endothermic. Okay? So, lots of energy in, Less energy out. That means overall, it's endo. What about when you have a weak bond is broken and a strong bond formed? Then you have to be exo, right? So this has to be exothermic. Because you're going to break something, it takes a little bit of energy and form a strong one, get a lot of energy. Okay, so most of the time when we look at reactions, one of the things I want you to be able to do is look at a reaction and predict whether or not it's exothermic or endothermic. So what you need to do is you need to look at the structures. They'll usually be line dot diagrams, right? And you'll have to look to see, well, am I breaking strong bonds and forming weak bonds? <coughs> Are the number of bonds, I've been breaking two bonds and forming one? Let's say the bond strengths were all the same. 
and I break two bonds and I form one. Is that going to be exothermic or endothermic? Break two bonds, form one. I'm going to take twice the energy in, and I'm going to get one times the energy out. So that would be an endothermic process. Okay? So now, <clears throat> if it's an endothermic process, right, you expect the temperature to go down. Because why? Because it's going to be sucking energy from its surroundings. What do you think you have to do to endothermic reactions to get a product most of the time? You're going to have to add heat to it. Right? So endothermic reactions are often facilitated just by adding heat to it to get the reaction to go faster or get to more product. Okay? If a chemical reaction results in an increase in temperature, right? it's exothermic. So what do you normally think you have to do to get more product? This is actually Le Chatelier's principle, right? Exothermic reaction. You want to get more product out. What do you normally have to do to it? Cool it, right? Now, the one catch to this, I always tell people, this one makes great sense. You heat it up, you get more product. That's great because when you heat it up, the reaction also goes faster. But if you have to cool it down, then it's like this trick. You know, like I cool it down so I can get more product, but if I cool it down, then the reaction goes too slow. And you know the other dangerous thing? This is what I was talking about this in the lab the other day, showed you some videos. If you get an exothermic reaction and it produces a lot of heat, then that makes the reaction go faster, that produces more heat, it makes more reaction go faster, it produces more heat. And this is usually where you have like horrible accidents. Right? Horrible. Did I, did I show you that video? Who was in the lab that I showed the video of that factory exploding? That was a, what's called a runaway reaction. It just, you can see it looked like a nuclear bomb went off at this factory. Uh, no, this was, the, this was actually one that sort of started uh, the whole, like, ref the, the, that made people much more aware. <coughs> it happened back in, I think, the late 90s, early 2000s. <clears throat> okay, so one of the general principles of scaling up an experiment is you never scale it up by a lot. Uh, that lab accident that happened at UCLA, the one about the Angora sweater and the girl that... Yeah, that, apparently that was one of the reactions they scaled up a lot. By how much? Uh, by like 100. In general rule of thumb, you shouldn't scale up anything more than a factor of 10. Just because when it gets out of control, it's 10 times out of control more, right? So, so this factory, I'll show the video again in the other lab sections, I guess. They scaled it up by factors of thousands and thousands. They'd done it in a little beaker, a right, little reactor, and then they made this gigantic reactor, and then what ended up happening is they couldn't cool it fast enough, and so it get hotter and hotter. It had lithium metal and a bunch of other stuff in it, and it just went poosh. And they have surveillance cameras from, like, way off, and you just see this mushroom cloud go poosh. Like, oh, well, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, when you get a mushroom cloud, you generally, that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we have what are called reaction coordinate diagrams. Okay, you guys remember these from Chem 1B. The reaction coordinate is this bottom coordinate here. What is that supposed to represent? It's like the reaction clock. It's the progress of a reaction. If you could put time on it, you could put time on it, but it's not like linear time. It's not like this is one second and this is two seconds. It's the progress of the reaction as you go from having reactants to products, okay? And then on the left-hand scale, typically in a reaction coordinate diagram, uh, we put either delta H or delta G. So in this case, we have delta H. So if the products are lower in energy than the reactants, then this hump goes like this and then drops, right? That's an exothermic reaction because the products are lower in energy than the reactants. What if it goes the other way? All right? Product goes in, then it's endothermic, and the products are higher in energy than the re original reactants. Now, um, let me see what I got on my next slide, actually. It's funny, I just looked at these slides and reviewed them again, and I still can't remember what's on the next slide. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So just the, what I said before, if you're doing a chemical reaction 
and delta H is positive, then you would heat it to get more product. And if delta H is negative, you would cool it to get more product. Again, the thing you have to worry about for exothermic reactions is if you cool them, you might cool them down to the point where you don't get a product because the reaction is so slow. Okay? By the way, when I talk about cooling the reaction and saying, then, oh, and then the reaction gets to be really slow, what's the whole area of Chem 1B that we study that relates to the rate? Kinetics, okay? So thermodynamics and kinetics are two different things, and I'll talk about kinetics in a lot more detail for organic chemistry, but um, kinetics is how fast reactions go. Thermodynamics tells us where equilibrium is, how much product you can get out of a reaction, whereas kinetics tells us how fast the product is formed. Okay. So most of the time we think of exothermic reactions as being spontaneous, okay? Because if you think about where you put a ball, you take a ball and you put it on top of a hill. I'm going to do my famous ball on a hill diagram. Okay, it's not famous. <coughs> but I have to tell you what it is because otherwise you won't recognize it. There's a ball. And there's a hill. Right? And you would say that the ball could spontaneously do that. No problem, right? That's an enthalpy diagram. I just took the bump in the middle out of the way. And you would say, sure, that can be spontaneous. And then I say, well, that means endothermic reaction like this. Can that happen? Not unless something else happens to pull it along, okay? Now, so here's the deal. Let's say, uh, let's say uh, you twist your ankle. You're on the uh, all-pro kickball team, and you, there's no such thing. Well, there might be. There's weird people out there. They probably wear giant pajamas and play kickball. So let's say you twist your ankle, right, and the trainer comes over, what are they going to do? They're going to ice it down, right? What if they don't have ice? What do they do? They wrap it, but how do they get it cold, though? They put water on it, get evaporation. But what, come on, guys. You, you guys never sprained an ankle on a team? Oh, that's right. You're organic chemistry students. <laughs> they got that little pack, right? And they go... I mean, I just saw one like two days ago. They snap it, it gets cold, and it wasn't on me because I don't do that kind of stuff. Kickball's not my thing. And they, that thing gets cold. What kind of reaction is that? Exo or endo? endo. It's endo, but it's spontaneous because clearly it's happening. It's getting cold, right? So you can have spontaneous endothermic reactions. And the thing, that unseen force that drives these reactions is entropy. So there's this term, we use this term, it's actually called entropy-driven. Those describe endothermic reactions that are spontaneous because they can only be driven by entropy. Now, it says entropy could be thought of as molecular disorder, randomness, or freedom, and this is possibility of states, availability of states. That's the freedom part, okay? So you notice he covered all his bases there. But entropy may most accurately be thought of as, and blah, 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 energy, the states, the energy can be distributed over. It's availability of states. Okay, so now, Oscar, we're going to play a game. Is it fun? Well, not really. Crying game? Uh, what? <laughs> crying game? You know, do you know the softest punch game? Do you remember that one as a kid? Who could punch the softest? Nah, you're all we lost. Yeah, it's like, you guys don't know this game? Yeah, you're right. Good. I won't tell you. So then, um, let's say Oscar has to make some choices. Good or bad choices. Right? And there's a series of rooms that he can go into. He can either go this way or this way. Now, <clears throat> he's going to flip a coin. Pretend he has a five-headed coin. 
<laughs> right? And he flips it. What are the chances that he's going to go to any one particular room? 20%, because there's five choices. All right, so 20% chance going here, 20% chance going here, 20% chance going here, 20% chance going here, 20% chance going here. Now, they're separated by a hallway, right? What are the chances he'll go left? 60% chance he'll go this way. 40% chance going this way. And all things being equal, if the energy is the same, right? The chances that Oscar will end up on the left-hand side are 60%, right? right-hand side or 40%. I almost said 50% and I realized, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Let's do another game. So which way did I go? Well, we don't know. It's, it's statistical. Those, you're, you're an electron. So you're 60% over here, 40% over here. Now, now I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. Hotel. It's a hotel, yeah. <laughs> this is a strip strip hotel. Like the ones they have in Reedley? No, the classy Well, it could be classy. They usually say like best hotel. <laughs> Whatever it is, they have to tell you that we're the best. You just know, like mm. <laughs> So which way does Oscar go now? <coughs> it's going to go to the right. <laughs> I mean, sure, you can count up the squares. One, two, three, four, five, and five is 25, and this is three. So the chances they will go to the right are 25 out of 28, and the chances they'll go to the left are just three out of 28, right? This is availability of states. All things being equal, Right? He's most likely going to go to the right. This is actually what entropy means. Entropy is just the availability of states. Oscar, you don't have to go to either side, really. I'm not going to force you. But let's say this costs $5 a night, and this costs $10 a night. Well, which side are you going to go to? I'm going to go to that size, $5 a night, there's a whole bunch of rooms, at $10 a night, there's only a few rooms, right? So, so you have a situation, this is the $10 a night side, this is a $5 a night side, definitely an exothermic reaction, it's easier for you to be on the right hand side, there's way more choices you to be on the right hand side. Okay, now let's do this. Right, if you can find a hotel room for five bucks, good luck. <laughs> it's called a cardboard box in the street. <laughs> now, you get the nice moving boxes, the refrigerator boxes from like U Haul. Those are pretty cool. <laughs> and you can actually, we cut windows in them, made little castles, and, and then you cut the tops and you make a roof out of it. We're pros at this. Be moving to a corner near you. <laughs> that was uh, the first house my son uh, James owned. So, uh, well, he was like one or two. <laughs> it was his house. He'd hang out in there. Property <laughs> Then I charged him, ta you know, taxes and stuff, and utilities and food and all that. So I made some money on him. <laughs> okay, Oscar. I switched it. Now those rooms are ten bucks and these ones are five bucks. These are the deluxe suites. Okay, which one are you gonna try to go for, to first? Yeah, you want to go to the left, but there's so many more choices on the right. You might end up going to the right just because there's so many more choices, right? And Oscar, you look like the ten dollar hotel guy, not the five dollar hotel guy. Let me tell you. So, endothermic, but the chances are that you'll end up on the right are much greater than you would be on the left. This is an entropy-driven situation.
So entropy can drive a chemical reaction. Just because there's more ways to distribute the given amount of energy, the energy that you have is this. Right? Molecules have energy in the form of kilojoules or kilocalories or whatever else we want to call them. All right, so anyways, that's sort of the description of entropy rather than just calling it disorder. It's not really disorder. It's the actual number of states that you can go into that are available that dictate whether or not a reaction will be entropy driven or not. Okay, so for molecules, right, if you can put the molecules in different vibrational, rotational, translational states, we talk about different states of a molecule, the more it can wiggle, the more it can fold or bend, or the more it can distribute itself over a volume, those are all things that favor entropy. If you have a situation where you have A goes to V, Plus C. Sorry, not trying to write. That's actually really hard to do. Right? This side would be favored by entropy because there's more states available on this side than there are on this side. So this would be positive entropy. This is positive entropy. More states available than you had originally. Okay? Now, uh, this explained how. It's really hard to explain how. We haven't, you guys haven't had enough. Um, physical chemistry. I'm going to guess none of you have had physical chemistry to explain it, but you remember how uh, and Bohr's model we talked about for the atom, we had energy levels, right? And then we had S, P, D, and F. We talked about quantum model of the atom. There was energy was quantized. Each quantum level is a state. And it turns out vibration, rotation, and translation, all those energies are actually quantized. So there are certain vibrations a molecule can't have, and there are certain vibrations that are allowed. These are known as vibrational states. It's the same as energy states for an electron in an atom, but instead of the calculations being based on wave function of an electron in an atom, it's about the vibrations that are available to a molecule. But actually, when we look at organic chemistry, and this is actually what infrared spectroscopy measures. This is like one kind of vibration. This is actually known as scissoring. Molecules can scissor. They can stretch. Right? They can wag. And they can do this. I forget what that what's called. Rock. Right? So you can do this, or you can do this, or you can do this. Or you can do all of them. And that's called Pilates or something. <laughs> And you can tell I'm not very good at any of it, so there you go. So uh, mm, let's take a look at these two. How many atoms are in each of those? Say that again? Six, right? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there's a couple more hydrogens over here. Won't worry about that. Two, actually, literally two hydrogens is one. And then there's you know, 12 hydrogens here. Which do you think might have a greater entropy? The one on the left, because what can it do? It can do all kinds of wiggly stuff, right? So this guy can wiggle much more than this guy can. Not that this guy doesn't wiggle and flip and boat and chair and all that good stuff, but this guy can rotate these bonds, rotate these bonds, rotate these bonds. It can rotate in space a lot. These both can rotate in space. But there's a lot more freedom in this molecule, higher entropy, more available states, Lower entropy, fewer available states. Another way that we see entropy, and I'll just show you this, it's kind of interesting. More translational, that is, it has more place to, translational in, in, in molecules ease talk, just means there's more space for it to move through, right? So if I take a closed container like this, and I don't allow any heat to exchange, I mean, I, I, I isolate this system, and I open the valve, this valve right here. Naturally, gas molecules go from the left side. Where's the left side? There, the left side to the right side. Until what? Until you reach an equilibrium of states where you have the same number of molecules on the left, same number of molecules on the right. As this volume gets bigger, let's say you make this one bigger, what's going to happen? There are going to be more molecules on this side, but they'll be equally concentrated on both sides. Okay. So as it turns out, okay, the number of possible translational states that are available 
are related to how much space the molecule has. Okay, so if I make these sides the same, and then the gas molecules go over to here, I'll get an equal distribution of molecules on both sides. It becomes an equilibrium. This is why the molecules move. Increase in overall entropy as the gas molecules move from the left side to the right side. Okay. And if I make this side even bigger, right? So now I make it like monstrous. I could make one side small too, I guess. Oh, it's off the screen. Okay, then what's going to happen is I'll still get an equal distribution concentration-wise, right? but there's a lot more entropy available states over here, so more of the molecules will be on the right side than there will be on the left side, just because of the availability of states. Size of the molecules also matters? Yeah, size matters too. Bigger molecules tend to have higher entropy because they have more things to move around. Right? Uh, if you make more products... Then you have reactants, that's an indication of higher entropy just because you have more products and you have reactants. Okay, so, yeah, so this is where the, again, where the uh, chemists tend to get a little bit high on themselves. They start talking about the system and surroundings. All right, here's the system and the surroundings. We have an entropy, entropy change for the system plus the entropy of the surrounding, and then we call this S total. And if you remember in the Tro book, the Tro book calls that delta S of the universe. Yes. I felt so powerful at that one moment that I realized, what? I have not that power. Actually, maybe my wife does, but. <clears throat> Sorry. If delta S for any process, that is the difference in entropy from products minus reactants is positive, okay? this delta S total is positive, then it's a spontaneous process. There is an increase of entropy in the universe. That's how Tro would like to say it. Okay. It's a spontaneous process. Entropy of the universe is related to the system plus the surroundings. So, um, if delta S for the total, for the universe, is negative, what does that mean? Non-spontaneous. That's the non-spontaneous situation. Now, this is a little tricky. I don't know that it's properly introduced. Let's say that I have this gas situation like this. And I block energy from transferring into the system and then I expand the gas, okay? The, the only relation, the system, remember this is just like isolated, the only relation that the entropy of the system has with the entropy of the universe is through heat transfer. That is the only way that a system can, inter a system's entropy can, or a system can affect the entropy of the surroundings is through exchange of energy, heat. That's what we call Q, okay? Well, if I isolate this, this is still going to happen, and the entropy of the universe on the outside doesn't really matter, but the entropy of the system is going to be large and positive, so as a result, delta S total has to be positive. It happens just because delta S total is positive for the system. But if I allow heat exchange from the universe, energy exchange from the universe, okay, what normally happens to gas as it expands? Like, okay, I'll give you a hint. Give you a hint. You, you're spray painting your neighbor's fence or a wall in the alley. I don't know what you're doing. But you have a spray paint can and you're going, shh, shh. What happens to the temperature of the can? Cold. It gets cold, right? Same thing happens if you get that uh, gas in a can that you use to clean your computer parts, right? The gas in the can, you're going, shh. And blowing the dust everywhere. I always think it's funny because it, when I first started doing it, I'd do that and then all the dust would be outside and my computer would be clean. Now I get a shot back and I stick the shot back in there and I suck it all through the shot back and hope it doesn't ignite on fire. <laughs> Some of those gases are flammable. I'm not going to say how I know this. <laughs> but those are the best ones. 
We used to do that with aerosol cans. Like hairspray? Hairsprays. Phenomenal. For holding your hair in place, I mean. So. <laughs> But you get sprayed on stuff and light stuff on fire that's been had hairspray on it. Which seems like a bad idea. Yeah, it is a bad where idea. Where hairspray usually goes. Yeah. Burning hair. Gross. It smells bad. Okay. So now. <coughs> smell good? No. No. It smells bad. It's like burning people proteins. Mm. <laughs> okay. So. So. So, so what does this mean, though? Sorry, I got distracted again. This is what happens when I'm sick. I have a system, which is my can, and I'm expanding a gas to the surround to, in the system, right? So for the expansion of the gas, this is why it's not well set up, okay? What should the entropy change for the surroundings be? Now, the can, as it blows gas out, I could just blow it into another container so that the system is the gas can and then the, the empty container, okay? It gets cold, so it's endothermic, right? So what is it doing to the surroundings? It's reducing the energy of the surroundings by absorbing the energy. So the number of states that are available to you, okay, depends on your energy. If you have lower energy, you have fewer available states because you can't go into the different higher vibrational energy states if your energy has been lowered. So, as a result, the entropy change of the surroundings should actually be negative because you're sucking energy out of the surroundings. So for the expansion of a gas to be spontaneous with the transfer of energy, then what has to happen is the gas has to get more entropy. Delta S for the system has to gain more entropy than the surroundings lose. So not only does the, the entropy, the, the cooling of the can cause the surroundings to be less entropy because there's less energy, but because the can expands and it adds more particles to the rest of the surrounding? The well, the contents space. of the can expand. Right. So you're getting that expansion, right, just like you're doing in this closed system here. For the rest of the... The rest of the surroundings now there's less space for the for everything else. Well, there's not less space. Well, yeah, there is less space, but the, what we're thinking about is if you isolate it, okay, and so you have this closed system where you just got your can, you're blowing the coolant or whatever it is into the other container, it's going to have to absorb energy from the surroundings for it to be spontaneous. So there's less energy available if I have an isolated uh, closed, called a closed system. Not isolated systems when you, well, the first one I talked about, where you don't let energy or material transfer, but a closed system just means material can't transfer, but heat can. So for that case, then the entropy change for the surroundings will have, is negative, and so for the system to be spontaneous, there has to be more entropy increase by the material flying out of the can than there is by energy lost from the surroundings and a decrease in entropy because of that. Okay. <clears throat> So for chemical reactions, though, we have to consider both. So let's look at this and think about what's happening here. On the left, what's happening? One molar reactant, two moles of product. So for the system, delta S, or sorry, delta S is what? I'm going to put some values to these things. Delta S is positive, uh, positive because I'm gaining more stuff. What's delta H? It's also positive because I'm breaking a bond and making two things, right? So delta S has to also be positive. <coughs> Sorry, delta H has to be positive. So, for that reaction to be spontaneous, okay, 
this term has to create more entropy, and I haven't talked about exactly how this interacts with the surroundings, but recognize that the delta H is how the system reacts with the surroundings. So delta H is going to be removing energy from the surroundings. And as a result, lowers the entropy of the surroundings by removing energy from the surroundings. In order for this process on the left to be spontaneous, right, delta S for the total has to be positive, so the system plus the surroundings has to end up being positive. There is a chance that delta H is positive enough that the reaction is not spontaneous. If this number is big enough, and it absorbs enough energies from the surroundings, then the reaction won't be spontaneous. Does delta H usually have to be bigger by like a factor of 10 or? Well, actually, it's related to this. Just this is can be thought of as delta H over T. It's the amount of enthalpy divided by the temperature in Kelvin. That's one of those 1B equations that probably we're happy to forget. And you can actually, really, you can forget it. Because really, I want you to understand this stuff on a conceptual level, understanding entropy and entro enthalpy changes. Uh, let's just look at this one really quick. Um, cyclic to acyclic. What do you think? Delta S? Positive. Positive. More freedom. Delta H, it's also positive, right? Again, these reactions will be absorbing energy from the surroundings. If they require so much energy from the surroundings that delta S total is not positive, that is negative, then what happens is the, system, the reaction won't be spontaneous. Now, you could force the reaction to, to move along towards the product by heating it and doing all kinds of other stuff to it, removing products, adding reactants, you know, all the Le Chatelier stuff. But just in principle, that's how that works for delta H and delta S. Okay. So now let's think about this. The system reacts, re interacts with the surroundings by release it by, through energy, enthalpy, delta H, Q, however you want to call it. So let's say a reaction's highly exothermic. What does that mean? System to surroundings, lots of energy being transferred. So what does that mean about the entropy of the surroundings? It's going to increase a lot. If it's highly exothermic, right? Well, I, I, I should, guess I should have said highly... It just says exothermic. Let's say it's highly exothermic. Okay. Then the surroundings are going to get a lot of entropy, right? And regardless of what the system does, delta S of the total will probably be po uh, positive because there's going to be a lot more states available to the surroundings. So the reaction will be spontaneous. Okay? So any exothermic reaction, for the most part, has a very good chance of being spontaneous just because it increases the entropy of the surroundings. Let's say the reactions are highly endothermic. That means they're sucking energy from where? The surroundings, right? What happens to the entropy of the surroundings? It goes way down. Those, probably not spontaneous. Just because they require so much energy from the, from the universe to proceed. Okay? Now, you can force it along by heating it and adding heat energy to it and that kind of stuff. That's all the Chatelier's principle stuff. What if they're slightly endothermic? Those are the conditions I was talking about on the previous slide, right? Might be spontaneous, might not be spontaneous, depending on the enthalpy and the entropy together. All right, so I'm going to just skip it. This derivation is not important, but I mean, well, okay. It's really important, but I'm skipping it. 
you, you don't need, in other words, you don't need to know it for this class. But the final result, like for Chem 1D, you had to know it. For, for organic chemistry, this is what you need to know. Okay? I just want to point out the one thing in the derivation that is important. The way the entropy of the surroundings is related to the entropy <coughs> of the si enthalpy of the system is this equation. Oh, I left the negative sign out. Yeah, I forgot about that. I want to put that back in over here. So if you wrote this down, make sure you put a negative sign in there. So when you see this term, this is the term relating to the entropy of the surroundings. And it gets plugged into this equation so that eventually you get this, T delta S total is equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system. And this is actually what we call the free energy, delta G. And it's temperature dependent. Okay? So the bigger delta S is, positive or negative, the bigger the effect the entropy will have on the free energy of the reaction in determining its spontaneity. Okay. So with that, I am going to stop today. I don't know that I really want to get into this because it's a long, long analysis, and I have a lot to say about it.